Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. This is the most significant technological development in humankind's quest for understanding of the nature and origins of the cosmos since the Hubble telescope. The wonders that the Hubble has revealed will be multiplied by a far deeper look into that most distant limits of the known universe. This is a massive effort managed and coordinated by Northrop Grumman and directed by Northrop Grumman Vice President and Program Manager of the James Webb, tapes, the James Webb Space Telescope, Mr. Scott Willoughby. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Scott. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for your time and coming out here today to hear about uh, an amazing thing that, that our country is doing, uh, a chance in a lifetime uh, for me as a program manager, really a chance for this generation uh, to make its mark in the history books and, and learn more about ourselves, our planet, our solar system, and the entire universe. I got a presentation here that I'm going to try out on you. It's uh, bits and pieces of other ones. In this audience, I wanted to give my best. I've pulled together things that describe what the telescope does. I've pulled together slides that actually show real hardware. As a program manager, uh, there's the PowerPoint years, and you survive those uh, for a while until you start building hardware. I don't know who said it, but you know, hardware humbles. Software saves, if you're a software person in there. Um, and we're in the hardware humbling phase of the program right now, but, but hardware is awesome. So I'm going to actually show you real pictures of stuff being built right now that's going to go a million miles away from Earth um, and look back to the beginning of time. So I'm excited to show this presentation. We have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, I'd like to do just a couple things up in the beginning. One is I'm an engineer and I work on an unclassified program. So when you ask me a science question, I can't just say it's secret. That's usually my way to get away from answering something I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to have to defer to maybe Reggie Jew, our old system engineer in the back corner, who's also an engineer, but he knows it more. Or I'm going to ask you to, at the end, come up, talk to me, talk to Connie. Honestly, if I can't answer your question, you have some curiosity, we'll, we'll, we'll phone a scientist, we'll get you an answer, we'll get you an email and do it. Because I really want you to walk away and understand it. The other thing I want to do is I want to thank the museum here and Cindy for inviting me. It really is a pleasure to be here and I want to thank Dale um, for both inviting me here and being a part of the program. So I have a slide that I called a uh, program presentation called JWST by the numbers. In the middle I'm going to talk a little bit more of what's going on. I'm just going to give you a little bit of backstory of how I created these slides. I had a presentation to give to a quality organization at Northrop Grumman. And I didn't want to just go in there and say, you know, this is, this is big and hard and, and, you know, just impress them with some of the, you know, just what was important to me. I decided I wanted to somehow kind of captivate them in the program. So I started thinking back, what are the most impressive numbers about this program and that can illustrate and really make an impactful statement as to why this program is important? So I ask you to kind of enjoy this presentation and I'll go into uh, what they are. I'm going to start with a big number there. At the top of that slide is the number. 13 billion, 500 million. It's the biggest number in my slide. The answer to what that is, that's how far back in time the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna look. So put that into your, your head and trying to get around the concept of looking back in time 13.5 billion years. The universe is thought to be about 13.7 billion years old. That's when the Big Bang occurred and all the atoms that exist today anywhere and everywhere and all of the universe exploded at that point in time. We still don't understand how that occurred. And about 200 million years later, the first light of the first star formed. One of the key questions that I'll steal from you when I tell you that we're looking 13.5 billion years back in time and people say, well, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Is like, why did you stop short? You know, why didn't you go to those last 200 million? Well, the answer is easy. It was dark. So the first 200 million years of our universe, there was nothing to look at, nothing that a telescope could pick up. But we are going to go look like 13.5 billion years back in time, and, and how do we do that? And the easiest way I try and talk about that to folks is, think about going outside right now and looking at the sun. When you see that sun, do you know that's eight minutes old? 
If something had happened at any point in time in the last eight minutes, we wouldn't know it because it takes that long for light to travel 93 million miles. That's how far we are from our sun. So if 93 million miles is eight minutes, think about looking back 13.5 billion years. That's what our telescope is gonna do. And what is it gonna do in its mission? It's actually going to see the first stars formed which is a very different phenomena than stars that we can see today forming because stars today form with the benefit of the whole periodic table. There's carbon and heavier atoms and iron and all this stuff that can kind of come together, debris fields and dust that are out there in the universe that, that, that its own gravitational forces eventually pull together and then start you know, a reaction, a fusion reaction and then emit photons that we can see. We only had the benefit of helium and hydrogen at the beginning. So how did they come together? Our scientists want to know that. And this telescope's going to do that. Here's another very big number. Smaller than 13.5 billion, but it's 8 billion. Why does this number matter? That's how much money we have to do it. <laughs> the good thing is when I go to Congress, it's less than a dollar per year backwards in time. <laughs> I'll remind them that. And I actually cut the language out of here because, as I said, this presentation was meant to inspire people in different dimensions, not just how important it is to get it right, but how important it is for us to perform to the budgets that you, the taxpayers, have given us. And this is our cost cap. If you read the last line there, effectively, if we're a penny over, there's a senator, Senator Mikulski out there, who is one of the most powerful people in this country, who basically looked at the CEO of our company, Wes Bush, and said, you're going to do it for this amount of money. And he said, yes, ma'am. And then he gave me that talk, and I said, yes, sir. So we will do it for this money. We have been tracking to this budget every year for five years in one of the most difficult, technologically challenging programs ever undertaken, not just by Northrop, not just by NASA, but by mankind. So I'm incredibly proud of our team and our ability to perform to that. And we're three years away from launch, doing it under that cost cap. Next number. So we'll get a little smaller, just a tiny number like 1,500,000. What's the significance of that? Well, that's how far away we're going from Earth. Now I cheated a little for us in America. It's one and a half million kilometers, which is only one million miles, but one and a half million is a bigger number. So I went with kilometers in this case. <laughs> but just through the ratio, it's about two thirds mile per kilometer. So we're gonna be one million miles away from Earth. And we pick that for a very particular reason. It's because we have to get very cold. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit further into the presentation. And we're gonna get in this orbit at a million miles away. We're actually gonna go around the sun as the Earth goes around the sun, with the Earth always at our back. So we're gonna block the Earth and the sun from our mirrors, and I'm gonna talk about why that's important when we talk about this mission. But one million miles away from Earth is farther than most everything that we put out there. Most of the satellites that we build in this country, in this world, go in some form, form of Earth orbit, low Earth orbit. Hubble is only 250 to 300 miles away. The space station and the shuttle were able, you know, the shuttle was able to get up there and service it. We're not going out a million miles away to service this. Astronauts couldn't get out there to begin with, and robots haven't been developed to do that, but the intern and the rest of the next generation are gonna develop methods of doing that. <laughs> so we're going a million and a half kilometers or a million miles away from Earth. What's the next number on the slide? Well, I cheated. I put two numbers, but we're going smaller here. 40 and 178. Dale has these numbers memorized. They're tattooed into his brain. <laughs> Dale is the deployments chair for the James Webb Space Telescope. While we have hundreds of engineers building this, we know no matter what, there's the risk as we look at this stuff and go through an analysis and simulations, you know, you start building solutions, you know, in your own work environment, we have an independent team, completely independent from the program team, look at it. And Dale is the co-chair of that. Those numbers are 40 deployable structures and 178 release devices. Every single one of those has to work on orbit, traveling one million miles away from Earth. 40 things that have to move, hinges, deploying antennas, solar array structures, all of that nature. And to start off, it needs to be held together, what's called restraint retention devices that all have to fire. Single point failures. Space is such a hard environment, almost everything we build that we fly, we build two of, sometimes three or four of, of tweeters or, down, or boxes. 
You can't build two hinges and overcome one bad hinge. You just built two things that are hard that have to work. So these are all single point failures, something our engineers scrutinize. So that is an impressive statistic for those you who know, have been in any form of industry, airframe or space alike. Well, let's go negative. Got to find a negative number in there. Minus 388. That's how cold we get in degrees Fahrenheit. Or 38 Kelvin. But I didn't say 38 Kelvin because that's not as impressive a number as minus 388. <laughs> so this time I went to Fahrenheit and changed units on you. We will operate the optics of this telescope literally only 38 degrees above absolute zero where all motion and molecules stop moving. So in Fahrenheit, that's about minus 400. On the other side of the slide, you can see we have a hot side and that's about plus 200, plus 185. So our job is to block the sun, which we still need. We need the sun for our electrical power. It, you know, it bathes our solar arrays so that we can turn that into electricity a million miles away from Earth. But we won't operate if we're more than, you know, micro degrees above our necessary temperature of around minus 388. And I'll tell you a little bit why at this point in time. We're an infrared telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope, in effect, is a camera in the sky. It sees what our eyes sees. We photograph mostly in the optical, a little bit in the ultraviolet, a little bit in the infrared, but mostly in the optical, and its pictures are amazing. Well, it turns out Mother Nature threw a trick on us. I told you about that first light from 13.5 billion years ago. Well, it's been traveling through this universe, right, for a long time. We're gonna collect it with our big optics. But that light has been stretched into the infrared range by a phenomenon called redshift. Ask Reggie if you wanna know what that means. Redshift is an equivalent in the optical range or in light as Doppler is in sound. You know when you stand on a platform, something comes towards you, when it goes away, that's, if you're sitting in the car, it didn't make a different sound as you approach a person on a corner, did it? No. But when that sound comes to the person standing outside, it compresses coming to them and it stretches going away. Well, as optical light is moving faster in the universe, accelerating away from us, it's stretched, it's stretched from the visible portion of the spectrum to infrared. What is the other trick about infrared? Infrared is heat source. If I turned an infrared camera on this place right now, I'd see a lot. <laughs> I'd be blinded. We're all hot in here. But infrared is heat, so we have to be colder than what we're looking for. So we have to be minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit to do our mission. I went back a little 10, but then I made it a little cute. I put a plus on there. Why is 10 important to us? Because that's how long we're going to stay on orbit operating. And as we all know, certainly as proud Northrop Grumman and TRW Legacy space employees, there ain't nothing we put up there that just lasts what it's supposed to. We had Chandra up there now, launched in 1999, still operating. We have EOS, Aqua, and Aura, again in terms of science satellites, and we have a myriad of other military satellites that are still operating, going on decades. Milstar, a program I was proud to work on, that launched in February 1994, Milstar Flight 1 still operating on orbit. Our design life, our requirement from NASA was five years. We designed for 10. The thing that's gonna limit us is fuel. So it'll be when we run out of gas. So it's really gonna be up to the operators to efficiently point us in the directions off load momentum as we steer this thing in the sky. But we have a design reference mission set of you know, scenarios of all the different pointing we'll do that say we will make it at least 10 years. So, that's a kickoff of the numbers. I got a couple more at the end just to kind of seal this up. Let me give you a little bit more of the fun fact. The James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb was the administrator of NASA during Gemini, during Mercury, during Apollo. He was there from, I think, around 62 to 68. He did retire from that, that post before we landed on the moon in 69. But the reason they named a telescope after an administrator, not a scientist, because think of every telescope, Spitzer and Herschel and Planck, Hubble itself, you know, and everything that's pretty much out there is, and it's named after astronomers, certainly not named after engineers or program managers, right? So what happened was, is when Webb was running the agency for Kennedy and then Johnson, he said NASA shouldn't just be in this battle with Russia putting a man on the moon to win this power arms race to show we're more powerful, we should do something nobler than that. 
We should go up there and learn about ourselves. Science that S and NASA is really credited to James Webb and those observatories that came after is a key part of that. So they named it after. It's a six and a half meter telescope. I'll convert 21 and a half feet across are our optics. Hubble is a single optic 2.4 meters. We are 18 beryllium segments, each with seven motors behind them to control their surface figure that are gonna form the largest swimming pool on orbit to collect photons. Why does big matter? The swimming pool analogy is perfect. Perfect for us drought folks here. If you wanna catch more rain on that one rainy day, are you gonna get a taller glass? Ain't gonna help anyone you get a half an inch of rain. Just got a half inch of rain in the bottom of a very tall glass. What do you wanna do? Put your pool out there, you got a half an inch, you know, as wide as that pool. It's a lot more water. Same thing with photons. It's raining photons out there in the universe. You need bigger optics. So we're building the largest deployed optics ever. You can't even build optics this big the way you built Hubble. So we had to build it in pieces and then assemble it. You see six of those there. You see a mock-up on a lawn, and, and if you can, there's cutouts. It's 18 hexagonal segments that come together that form the primary mirror, a single mirror. It's going to launch in 2018 going out to a position called Lagrange Point 2, which is how far away? Look at that. Who's going to do the rest of the charts in the presentation? <laughs> so it's a successor to Hubble and Spitzer and many others, instrument, infrared instruments, very complementary to future ground-based telescopes. People ask, we build bigger telescopes on the ground because it's easier to just keep bringing trucks of cement and stuff up to the top of a mountain in Hawaii or Chile or Arizona and do that. But there's a problem, you're limited. You have to see through Earth's atmosphere. And it's very taxing. It tends to, you know, attenuate and, and knock down a lot of things. So we need to be in space for this mission. I've mentioned, and I sh you know, should mention again, that this is, is a partnership. NASA leads this, primarily out of Goddard. Uh, also running out of JPL locally here. Marshall and Johnson, I'll uh, talk a little bit about where they're doing a test down there. I fly over 100,000 miles a year uh, around this country following my hardware and what's going on, but it's led primarily out of NASA and Goddard and Greenbelt, Maryland. Also the ESA, the European Space Agency, the NASA of Europe, Canadian Space Agency, CSA, they donated. So as taxpayers, I talk about our $8 billion that we are spending on this program. Between the Europeans and the Canadians is about another $2 billion. This will launch on a European rocket. This will not launch for those who've been part of the business on an Atlas or a Delta, or, you know, out of Cape Canaveral or Vandenberg. It's going to launch in French Guiana because the European Space Agency has donated this rocket for us. Well, why would they be so generous to donate a rocket to us? Well, then that means part of the time on the satellite gets dedicated to their scientists. So they get a little sliver of time where they get to say, point that way. And that's a good partnership. It's a great way to go about this business. So we're partnered with them in many countries. I talked about Goddard, Northrop Grumman couldn't be prouder to be leading this. We won this competitively back in 2002. Yep, it takes 16 years to build a telescope. Um, I get you know, conversations sometimes with the airframe people that at one point in time were kicking an F-18 fuselage out every four days. Um, they wonder what's wrong with me. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get to that rate on web. Space Telescope Science Institute, that other acronym, will operate this. They're the same organization that operates Hubble out of Johns Hopkins University in uh, Baltimore. And then uh, we have a Nobel Prize. It's kind of cool hanging around with a Nobel Prize winner every now and then at, uh, at talks and wearing his pin. That's our chief scientist, who's a fantastic guy, John Mather. On the next slide, this is a graphic, a cutaway. What, what it allows me to illustrate, and because I'm going to show you baby pictures, you know, couldn't be a prouder papa here of, of, of the hardware that's been generated. We have a telescope, you know, illustrated with the pink purple colors up there on the top. That's the light catching. On the green refers to the instruments. So we collect this light so that we could put instruments with spectrographs and cameras behind those optics so that they can process that light into information to what the scientists can do. Those optics have to stay cold, so they have this large deployable sun shield, an umbrella effectively, we call the sun shield that blocks those optics. Five layers of capton that are either one thousandth or two thousandths of an inch thick. 
spaced perfectly over a 75 foot long but 45 foot wide three-dimensional shape in order to either reflect or vent out that plus 185 degrees Fahrenheit and get us down to near minus 400 on the other side. And then we have a spacecraft bus, which all spacecrafts do. It's a cool, simple name. We call it a bus because it drives us around. It's the steering wheel. It's the gas tank. It's the communications back to Earth. It's everything we need to survive on orbit and hang up there and do our mission. Of those four, Northrop Grumman is responsible for the telescope, the sun shield, and the bus. NASA, the instruments. But then Northrop Grumman builds this telescope. In 2017, everyone in this room has an open invitation between 17 and 18 to come up to Redondo Beach, to One Space Park, to our building M8, and look into a viewing window and see the telescope being built right here in your backyard before we put it on a boat and ship it to French Guiana and launch it on an Ariane rocket. It's going to be the most amazing sight, certainly, in the form of building uh, you know, space hardware or anything for that matter. This is amazing. This is real flight hardware. This is a pre-assembly state on the left of the back plane that holds those 18 uh, beryllium mirrors. That is about 25 feet high, 26 feet high. To the right of it is a tripod. That's the part that will deploy out for a secondary mirror that reflects the light from the primary mirror back into the optics chain. That structure, told you 26 feet high, holds its dimension, its surface accurate to one ten thousandth, one ten thousandth of the fraction of a human hair. It's about 30 something, you know, nanometers. It's amazing. They actually had to pick the carbon fibers. So over the length of the fibers, the diameter was about the same and lay them and impregnate them in the glue in the orientation such that their coefficient of thermal expansion would act in a manner to keep that assembly to 40 nanometers, the most precise optical structure of this size ever built. That hardware is now assembled and inside of those masks, people are smiling, I promise you, because they just finished years and years of work of building that, that's stowed. Two wings on the side are now folded back. The secondary is folded up. This is how it will go into the payload fairing after optics integration. That hardware now is in Greenbelt, Maryland, getting ready for a robotic arm to put the beryllium mirror segments in. That will finish not just in February, but on February 12th. So I'm a program manager. <laughs> this chart is our spacecraft bus. You see some people there as we're lifting it off a fixture in the manufacturing area. The base of that bus, that silverish ring, is where the launch vehicle clamp band will, let, will hold us. So we're going to lay down on top of that rocket and get clamped there. The bus basically is the first place that feels that force of the rocket as it's launching and going you know, at our, past the Earth out of its uh, atmosphere. That bus is one of the most complicated buses. Again, 10 feet in diameter, conical structure, shear panels, tubes and struts that hold the sun shield mechanisms and star trackers. One of the most complicated things on this observatory is as cold as we have to be, we still run the bus from the hot side, but we're pointing cold optics. So typical buses have a star tracker assembly that points, and you, you, know, you stabilize your platform and you use your momentum wheels to keep you. We have to keep our star trackers on the, on the hot side in the, because the, the scientists complain that we're putting too much heat near their instruments, so they made us put it on the hot side, but we have to run the optics on the cold side. An incredible engineering challenge. We took that bus and that stowed optical telescope element just two months ago, and we mated it in our high bay. We proved that the four mating interfaces between those that, that will hold it together for launch and then you know, fire and separate were in the right place and had the right alignment. It was an amazing, you know, so you see little people, little tops of heads there, you know, this amazing satellite being built in our M8 high bay. Now I'm gonna switch a little bit. The sun shield I've talked about, it deploys to 75 feet long by 40 feet wide. It's held by a composite structure that on each side it's a clamshell that comes up. If you, you'll see it in the video and around those optics, it stows like this and then it opens as the first deployment. That structure was all composite when it initially came off of the mold. And you see all that bare space in there, it looks tannish. That's just empty space. That's the tool on the other side. We have to be so precise about the mass of this. We don't want to throw another gram in space that we don't have to because we want to fill up the gas tank with as much fuel as we can. So we hog that thing out. 
So it supports all of its strength only with the absolute bare minimum necessary amount of composite structure. So it's all lattice structured and hogged out there and it's being assembled here in our building M3 in Redondo Beach. And this is one of the most uh, amazing pictures. There's a little person there in the middle of a sun shield membrane. Those membranes, 75 feet long by 40 feet wide, are three-dimensional in shape in order to set the venting paths that we need. They are built to 0.75 inches RMS of their surface figure themselves to what they need to be. They're comprised of 54 gore materials that are cut out and individually seamed together with 10,000 inches of seam, 100,000 welds to hold this shape over a 600 degree thermal differential depending on where they are in the stack. We have built an entire full-size SunShield demonstration article, and that's me and Sarah, standing in front of a five-layer SunShield, and that's just a test model. We can't afford to try and build this right the first time. We have to build it and beat it up. And then we deployed it. And what you see here is the glory shot of after all the hard work INT's done. What you don't see is before then, we put simulators for the optics on top of it and we put all these stay out zones in so technicians had to fold it like they will in flight. So they couldn't cut corners here. Figure out their arms are long enough, if the diving board can get in there, if the crane can reach this. And that's mostly what we learned, is how can we assemble something? You think of the hardest problems in the world, a lot of times it's the easiest problems in the world but that become hard literally just reach and access and assembly. We proofed we can assemble and stow and deploy. The next slide goes into our timeline. Just give you appreciation. The same four critical paths I talked to you about, instruments, telescope elements, sun shield, and the bus. Right now, you see going into, we're coming out of 2015, and literally next year, those subsystems are coming together. We have mirrors and a structure, instruments going to the back end, that thread into that next green box there, that you can't read the title, it says OTE with ISIM, the telescope with the instruments. Really cool fun fact about Webb. The hardest test on this program will be when we optically test the instruments and the mirrors. It's gonna be done at Johnson Space Center in Houston. You know, Houston, we have a problem. We all know about Houston. But Houston has one of the most amazing thermal chambers, 70 feet high. The only one, there's one in Plumbrook, but the only one today that's been modified with a helium shroud to test the cryogenic temperatures. The chamber itself can get down to near zero degrees Kelvin, zero Kelvin, absolute zero. We set a background environment, we're gonna test those structures. That chamber was also the same chamber that tested the Apollo capsules. Cool story was, it was a historic monument when we started the program. It wasn't being in use. So I don't know, anybody own a historic house here and try and paint it? You know, where's Dale? You know, those art juries, you know, people who run the communities, they're tough on you in terms of what you want to do at your house. Well, think, they turned over the chamber to the parks department because NASA wasn't using it anymore, but it was, you know, it tested Apollo, come on. We're not going to get rid of it. They held on to it. And then uh, Webb came and said, oh, we want to use it. But we got to kind of clean it up a little. <laughs> um, so the parks department had to give it back to NASA. And now it's been modified for us. The testing is going to be only greater. Now, in another 20 years, when my kid or somebody's up here talking about the next telescope that's 18 meters in diameter, we're gonna say that they tested it at the chamber that did Apollo and Webb, right? We're gonna be a part of, part of that proud legacy. So I have two more charts, and I won't bore you anymore. I'll let you ask some questions. We'll see if we can get a deployment video, but we'll do questions as uh, the team goes. So I went back big. It's a pretty big, sizable number, 100 million. I wanted to throw a number out that the engineers wouldn't be able to figure out. Because if you click the next slide, it's just a picture of faces. It's the people who did the design and the technicians turning wrenches. I calculated very, very, very conservatively that at the end of this program, people would have de dedicated 100 million hours of their life to building this. So that's a legacy. That's 16 years, at some point in time of you know, two, 3,000 people, and you go through it. That's how much time is being put into building this. And I told you I wanted a shock and awe quality organization. So I put zero as my last slide and hit that. If you don't get it right, we got a zero chance of doing our mission and detecting signs of life and finding the first stars ever created in the universe. So we are gonna get this right. We're working on the shoulders of giants already who've done amazing things that their generation didn't think could be done. So we're making that greater but we're just advancing technology, we're advancing the human spirit, as we've always done in this country. 
So everybody in this room could be proud of a role that you've played as an engineer, as a business person, as anybody a part of a big program doing something that was hard, nationally critical. We just keep building on that, right? All of those processes is how we work today. You know, we didn't learn it new. We just keep pushing the edge of the envelope. So the question was, how were we able to determine the cost and the timeline with so many variables? Well, I'll be the first to admit, we determined it a few times. <laughs> and, uh, but we're, we're holding tight. The first eight or nine years of this program were really about developing technology that never was developed before. And at that point in time, we actually had an estimate to launch in a few different years as recent as about 2014. And it was too hard to get there. At the time that we replanned this in 2011, when we knew that mark wasn't going to be made, we had been through what I'll call the hard parts of the technology. And while we knew we were doing new stuff, we basically could still go back to our old skills of we build a hinge and a deployable, we build a bus and we test the propulsion system, the power system, the attitude control. 50 years of legacy now has created an incredibly confident path that we are proud to say we've operated on for five years, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But it took a couple of swings at it to get it right. But very confident we have it now. So the question was about a lot of the components going to Goddard, the NASA center where this is operated. What do they do before it comes back to us? Because I mentioned it does all come back to us. So the most important two things that are being done at Goddard, first of all, I mentioned they're responsible for the instruments. They are testing the instruments in cryogenic chambers and on shaker tables to prove out that the optical instruments on their own bench, a separate composite structure, are working together as a team, because they obviously got tested individually as their own, you know, wherever the instruments came from. We're also doing the optical integration. You could actually go to NASA's website and, and again, Google up web, uh, you know, video cam in Goddard, and you'll see every minute a still image of our structure. We're going to do the optics integration there. When the mirrors are on the structure and the instruments are tested, we'll put those two together at Goddard, test at Johnson, return to Redondo Beach. In parallel, we'll build our sun shield and we'll build our bus here and then we'll bring it together. I'm gonna to take one more question and then go to the video and then more questions. Yes, sir. The question was, when we started the program in 2002, we brought a teammate, Ball Aerospace Technologies on. They're still a part of the team. The majority of the work they did was the responsibility for the development of the mirrors, these beryllium, uh, you know, world-class mirrors. Uh, they're complete with that job but they also have incredible optical system engineers that are actually stay with us through launch. So they have a contract there, and they're also doing some of what are called our, are the radiators that help um, get the, the heat to, to deep space. So they do have some roles, the majority of it has done. And I would like to mention, there was two other incredible teammates that have been a part of this, that, you know, uh, ATK out of Magna, Utah, and then the, per, the company with the, the award for most name changes, when we won the contract, Kodak, in Rochester, won the optics integration and the Johnson test, then they became ITT, then they became Excellus, currently they are now Harris, so Harris, <laughs> through that legacy, um, is a part of the team also, and they're, uh, uh, the, all three of them are subcontractors to us, but do amazing parts of the observatory. So I'm going to show a deployment video, talk through it, it's about five minutes, and, uh, and then we'll go to some more questions if you have it. And in this case, the music is just more to put you in a, a, a peaceful state. <laughs> uh, so what this is going to show in time lapse is in a time stop, uh, hopefully there, if we go, is launching from Earth. That is us coming off of Earth and separating from the top of the launch vehicle. This entire process will take 29 days to get a million miles away. And on the bottom, I know it may be hard to see, over here, will mark different things. You can see Earth and you can see the moon. The moon is 250,000 miles away from Earth. So we're going four times further than the moon. So you can see as we approach the moon, we've deployed our solar array. First thing you want to get out there, of course, so that you can start converting that sun to electrical power and get off your battery. So you can, you know, have that, an us, an unlimited source of, of power. Then we do some burns and we course correct. And we're on our way here, you know, moving ourselves towards the moon. And we have a number of burns, and we're still in the first day. We're only at hour 18 at this point in time. Yet we've gone pretty far. You can see we're near, you know, uh, three quarters of the way uh, to the moon. Once we get ourselves positioned, we, we take our antenna, 
that enables us to communicate at a higher data rate to Earth, so we can, you know, uh, not just command and telemetry, but we want to start dumping the solid state recorder on some telemetries and things that we've read. So we get that. We've now just passed the, lar the farthest place man has ever been from Earth, which is Apollo 13. They had to go a little further around the moon for that slingshot gravity maneuver, that uh, assist maneuver that they had. So a little bit further on the backside. We're past there. And then we start opening in that clamshell I told you. Remember that composite structure all hogged out? Well, the front side is going to release. We're going to do another tilt maneuver with our rocket engines. And all the meanwhile, there's other things happening that you can't see in here where release uh, bolts are firing in order to enable things. And then we're going to open the back half of that clamshell. So at this point in time, we've exposed the mirrors. We've opened that clamshell. We're getting ourselves in a position where we can actually separate the telescope from the bus. That's a one and a half meter, you know, five, six feet deployment. In order to get our thermal isolation, we sit tight, ready for the launch with four bolts, but then we need to separate because that sun shield takes a lot of space when it deploys. So we do that deployment. Next thing coming here are the covers. So the membranes are protected from anything that's an initial part of our ascent stage, from any kind of debris or anything else uh, with regard to the atmosphere. The covers come out, and now you see mid-boom deployment one of two. Now, the mid-booms come out, they make the sun shield wide. So we already made it long, 75 feet long. Now we need to make it wide, 40 feet wide. Those mid-booms are basically a nested set of telescoping tubes. I still got an old car that has a, an antenna that goes up, you know, in those conical segments, right, or the, the tube segments there. So that's basically what's happening. We build out of Astro and Carpinteria, a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Northrop. Both sides have come out, and when they're done, we do membrane tensioning. Now we start coiling in gears and motors, and we have to pull those five layers which were collapsed together apart, and we have to set the shape of those. So we've got that separated. Now we have a thing called a momentum management, a trim tab on the back. This is a big solar sail when we're out there. The sun exerts pressure on things and can push you. So we're a big sail, and we need to balance that sail so it hits us in a in, in relatively even state. So after we get the membranes tensioned up, we're still at day eight, right? We turn on a cryocooler. I didn't mention Northrop Grumman with JPL are building a cryocooler that will get one instrument to six Kelvin, only six degrees above absolute zero. We then deploy that tripod that holds the secondary mirror out there because the light bounces off the primary into the secondary, then back into the middle of the telescope. We deploy some things that reject heat into deep space. I call them radiators because I'm from New Jersey. We then deploy one of the wings on day 12 on one side. On day 13, day 14, we deploy the second wing. So for two weeks, it takes us to deploy this on orbit. After that, 15 more days to get a million miles away. Those first two weeks, we have to hold our breath. So we're starting those practicing things in the conference rooms right now because this is going to be gut-wrenching. So 14 days of deployments, 15 more days of travel, 29 days later, we are a million miles away from Earth, and it takes us about five more months to cool down and calibrate. So that is us getting a million miles away in a deployment video. There's a couple different versions of that. Thank John Ehrenberg, our chief engineer, and Christina Thompson from our comms department for making this and many others. So again, you can show your family that. So uh, time for a few more questions. So the question was about, since we're dealing with very small tolerances, how do we accommodate these heavy loads of a launch environment? And it's not just the shaking, the acoustic loads that occur. Well, first and foremost, We'll, we test to those environments. As you know, we have shaker tables and acoustic chambers that will prove it work. There's a few things within design. First of all, it's the launch locks that endure most of it. So when we're into the deployed state, we could not survive that, that, those launch loads. So, so the launch locks hold us in a, in a way where we, we divert that load path to a place where we can absorb it in some beefy structures. The second thing is the mirrors have seven actuators on the back. So anything that needs to crispen up the shape of those mirrors, one on each corner of the hex, six of those, and then one in the center, a center curve, you actually push and pull on the center of that and do that. So we have some motors and we basically take it through the launch loads. And my wife is a mechanical engineer, she can answer more questions. <laughs> Sir, the question was, will I still be the program manager? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> Dale's been in, in, in these hard places today and he's still smiling. So I've got my faith here that we're gonna do it. This is the longest job I've ever had in my career and certainly the, the proudest one. I've been on this program now since 2009. I absolutely will, as long as you invite me. Is the, the question is about the deployment sequence. Is it pre-programmed before launch? It is, is pre-scripted. There are a number of stored command sequences that are pre-programmed. Some of them are, though, operator initiated. So it's not just hit one button and everything will happen. Uh, even though we could do automated checks of telemetries and ensure um, in case there is anything in there, we're basically gonna have our engineers at the console verifying, looking at the momentum from the wheels, looking to make sure we have you know, indications of an initiation of a deployment. So it's scripted, there's programs in there, but many of them will be initiated operator throughout the sequence by a, a button push. Sir? The question was about risk management and, and, and the life of, of getting this done. And risk management, again, is a process wherein you really create an if-then statement for everything to go wrong. If this goes wrong, then this happens. And you either want to do one of two things or both. You want to get rid of the if, <laughs> stop that from happening, or reduce the impact of the then. You know, when it happens, you know, maybe it will happen. Can, can I survive it? Can I get through it? So in that process, we've been through, I, I probably can't even enumerate how many risks um, that we have. The majority, though, just to give the simple top-level answer of what have powered us through is a lot of our risks were mitigated through a lot of what I'll call engineering model and pre-development work. So that full-scale sunshield membrane was to, de you know, to develop something to practice on because as much as the engineers can simulate in computer environments and push things to the envelopes and then create margin that says, even if it's worse, I can still do my job. Excuse me, you wanna be able to prove that out. So we did a full scale version of the Sun Shield, one of the largest risks, obviously, deployment. We also did a center section that holds 12 of the 18 mirror backplane. That's at Johnson right now in the chamber with two engineering model primary mirrors and a secondary undergoing test as flight will. So we mitigating risk mostly by building something in advance and we put that in our, in our uh, schedule plan through launch to do that as opposed to recover from that. Yeah, the question was if the sun shield isn't fully tensioned or as touched, it will destroy the mission. The answer is, is no to a great degree. There's a number of things that have been over-designed in the sun shield. The number of membranes itself in order to block that. And we didn't want to go any more than necessary because then it's harder to stow them. Um, but we looked at thermal shorts, would, would be a touching in a thermal vac simulation. Again, where we put actually only a third scale in there because we couldn't fit a full scale in. Um, so we've provided for margins within that. And depending on where it is and how the temperature leaks through to the mirrors, even if some of the mirror segments get slightly hotter, you know, depending on where the photons hit, you may lose some of your capacity, but not your full functionality. Hey, Reggie, what's our data rate? <laughs> um, it's a great question. I always get stumped with things that I can't remember. It's cost $8 billion. And it's got 40 deployable devices and 178 release devices. Um, our data rate, let me, let me, let me, let me be uh, good about answering the question, and, and I'll get you that. First of all, our data rate, we store, we don't continuously data dump to the Earth. We do use the deep space network that talks to all of the, you know, satellites that go that far in the far reaches with the three antennas. We have, you know, pickups at Earth, you know, because Earth is rotating behind us. And we store data in a solid state recorder, a TiVo in the sky, and then we periodically data dump. And we're not going to be data rate limited for for what we can store and dump and store and dump. So I'm sorry, I don't have the exact, do you remember the number? <laughs> I'd say it's about 10 kilobits. About 10 kilobits? Uh, yeah, so, but we'll, we'll do that. I'm sorry, was there a part two to the question? Yeah, the, the, resolution the resolution of the pixels. I've heard that we will be putting into space more pixels than ever before. And I believe it's on the order of 50 megapixels which is certainly much more, and it doesn't sound, you know, it's not one of these things where we're 10 orders of magnitude. That is sufficient to do the mission. What's actually most impressive about our mission is it's not as much as the resolution matters in the pixels, it's our ability to isolate on pixels and hone in on just small parts of the universe. So one of the instruments, the near-infrared spectrograph, has a micro-shutter array 
a, basically a set of little louvered windows that sit in front of the focal plane array. And if you just want to hear this or see this and you want to darken out, you flip all the other shutters off and you just pick the few pixels that are on that and then you can kind of accentuate, get a better signal to noise ratio. So even though it may not sound like, oh my God, we're doing, you know, whatever tons of, you know, gigapixels, we still can create very, very fine resolution stuff. Yeah. Question from the minion in the audience. I love your t-shirt. How long does it take to communicate with James Webb from Earth? It's on the order of a couple, you know, two and a half minutes round trip for what we're doing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it takes eight minutes for light to get 93 million miles. We're one million miles away further, so you know, it's, it's certainly shorter than that, but then there's some processing time, and, and the things that we have to worry about the most are not the one-way communications, but the two-way communication. When we send something, and we need an answer back in order to send something back, uh, so that loops on the order of a couple minutes with our processing. Yes. Question about the radiation environment we're surviving in? Yeah, we're at a different orbit than, again, what we know very well, geosynchronous orbit, medium and, and low Earth orbit. So, I don't think increase is the right answer, but it's different. So we did have to come up with an environment, you know, that, that made sure both our electronics were protected. But actually, there's a lot of things we do in geosynchronous commsats with tantalum shields to protect those that I think we're a little less uh, vulnerable to. But we now have uh, three or four good satellites out there at L2, uh, Gaia most recently, and Herschel and Planck that are characterized in that environment, and, and they, they fit our design parameters. So it's different an environment there, but one that's very acceptable in terms of our ability for our electronics to survive. Awesome question. You know, you talk about, I've talked about all of the technologies we developed. The question is, well, what's going to be next, you know, that we're going to continue to pursue and use these and advance these and develop this? Probably the most important thing is we are doing a deployed optic, what we call adaptive optics. So not just a fixed optic, but a deployed segmented optic with motors where we can control that. Now it's not a dynamic control. We don't need to keep the motors going. We kind of crisp it up, but then you know, environmental conditions as necessary, we can fine tune that, that focal plane. But in order for us to do, so I've talked about in a, you know, so much about the engineering because I'm an engineer, you know, but again, to re-hit home what we're doing science-wise, looking back in time, one of the things I didn't really state, which was we can look at planets around other stars. They're called exoplanets now, which we've characterized most importantly with a mission called Kepler, into their atmospheres and detect signs of life. We're actually going to use this telescope and say there is a planet out there that has oxygen and methane and carbon dioxide and the things that we're used to in our environment. So, so then the next question is, well, how do you see what's on that planet? Can we, we can only image or look at the atmospheres of these planets. You need bigger optics. So adaptive optics are key. We're never gonna be an optic you know, big, bigger than even Hubble's because you only have a five meter fairing to fit in on a top of a vehicle. So we're either gonna have to assemble on space or build larger deployable optics. We're more foldable. So that's a big technology. The next thing we're already talking about with NASA is a 12 to 18 meter telescope, two to three times bigger than Webb. And with optics that big, and if we look in the, both the optical, the UV and the uh, IR range, we'll be able to directly image one of those planets, look at its surfaces for oceans, look at it for land masses, and the key for all is if we can find Yankee Stadium, it's an intelligent life form. <laughs> <laughs> People always wait for the Yankee plug in my presentations. You now have it. Oh, we lost yesterday, awful. It, it, the question was, if we're looking 13.5 billion, you know, what direction? Actually, we will look in all directions. It's, it's the universe, I can't explain this very well, but as it's blown up and expanding, there's a concept that says there's really not a center to the universe. <laughs> you know, things are there, and at any point that you're at, it's moving away from you. Hard for me to, to digest, but it is what they say. And, and so you're not really in the center, so we'll look in all directions. The, the, the great thing about our orbit and what we're doing, the Hubble orbit is a 90 minute orbit around Earth. They're actually in the dark 45 minutes and light 45 minutes in the dark. So they're, they're limited. We are always gonna be in a pointing you know, ability to see something. And over the span of the year, we can see the entirety of the universe. So it's just a matter of them kind of queuing up where they believe the stars are as informed by prior satellites uh, and observatories telling them where to look. So the question was about improving our data processing on Earth because we're gonna be getting so much. 
um, there's always a need. And, and even today, I'll give you an incredible figure of merit that I learned a couple years ago. The amount of data that Hubble's captured, Hubble just went on its 25th anniversary, its birthday on orbit there, is so great that actually today there are more papers being written from Hubble data out of the archives than from the missions. So, so data processing is important because people can't even keep up with the data and part of that being their ability to parse through the data or make calculations with it. So, you know, this is where like the Googles of the world and, and other companies have been quite impressive because data mining, data search, and data aggregate. But now again with Hubble, more papers get refereed every year on archive data, of which they named it the Mikulski Archives, which was fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna go one more question, because I'm on a roll here, and then I gotta stop before I mess up. So the question was about these 178, and there's an R in there, you know, they're either release devices or retention devices. They retain us and then we call them, you know, release. Um, a majority of them are actually off the shelf and most of them are non-pyrotechnic. They actually burn a fuse wire, but in order to minimize the shock of a pyrotechnic, which we have sensitive hardware to, we burn the fuse wire. And one of the, the devices is pretty slick, it's literally, a split spool that if you put a bolt in there and you put the spool together, it holds a bolt. You wind a wire around it that looks like a slinky and you hold it there and when you, when you separate that wire, the slinky unwinds, the spool separates, the bolt comes up. And a company called NEA, Non-Explosive Actuators, um, here in California is building the majority of those. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.